we are all inspired by the greatest martial artists that ever lived. But did you ever wonder what made them the greatest? How come they were different from everyone else? In the next 17 minutes, I will answer this question by briefly looking at the history of the greatest martial artists. We will start our history by looking at 400 to 190 BC ancient Greece, or more specifically Sparta. The Spartans are famous up to this day as creators of one of the first professional armies, where their warriors were intensely trained from the early age of 7 all the way up to 20, although their emphasis on military fitness began virtually at birth. All Spartan infants were brought before a council of inspectors and examined for physical defects, and those who weren't up to standards were left to die. Spartan warriors were feared as the most powerful army in the Greek world, and commonly known that one Spartan was worth several men of any other state. In 480 BC, in the famous Battle of Thermopylae, Spartan King Leonidas personally led an army of 300 Spartans and a few thousand Greek soldiers into battle against a much greater Persian army of more than a hundred thousand. Tactically using a narrow coastal path of Thermopylae, also known as the Hot Gate, with their extremely developed battle skills and tactics, Leonidas and his small group was able to hold against the Persians for more than two days of battle. Eventually, they were killed because of a local Greek betraying the secret path to Persians, which led to the assault of the Spartan army from the rear. Having dedicated their lives to the martial way, Spartan warriors could be easily considered to be as one of the first greatest martial arts of history. Yet although they were exposed to grueling and sometimes brutal training, not many know that they were also taught poetry, music, academics, and sometimes even dancing and politics. Each Spartan warrior followed a strict code of honor and placed emphasis on liberty, equality, and fraternity. To simply put, they had a deeper purpose for developing. They were not training to be simply brutal fighters, but rather to become pillars for their society. Support of their community was the source of their passion for constant improving, which surpassed mere technical training and led them to be extraordinary warriors that are legendary to this day. To continue our journey, we'll shift the attention further east by looking at 5th century China, or more specifically, the famous Shaolin Monastery where Shaolin Kung Fu has been created. Although it would be hard to point out the greatest Shaolin Kung Fu master of all time, throughout centuries, many of them have displayed incredible skills in this martial art. By developing not only their techniques, but also their bodies and minds, they are famous for being able to withstand incredible force and demonstrate amazing feats such as breaking glass with a needle. Many Shaolin Kung Fu masters have defeated various foreign opponents from Russia, Japan, and Europe in duels, proving the effectiveness of their style and also proving them to be some of the most early greatest martial artists. Yet here we can ask again, where did those skills and passion for their art come from? While it is not always confirmed, the creation of the famous Shaolin Kung Fu is often dedicated to Bodhidharma, an Indian Buddhist monk that brought Chan Buddhism to China, which later became known in Japan as the famous Zen Buddhism. Bodhidharma was a bodhisattva, a Buddhist term of a person seeking self-fulfillment in order to help all sentient beings. It is clear that Bodhidharma was led by this motivation as he spent nearly all his life developing himself in order to help others. Bodhidharma spent a big part of his life in the Shaolin Monastery. Based on the famous legend, he lived in a cave next to the monastery for nine years, where he spent all his time meditating while gazing at a wall and being silent. It was also said that he was disturbed by the poor physical shape of the Shaolin monks, after which he instructed them in martial arts techniques to develop both mind and body, thus the Shaolin Kung Fu was born. Shaolin monks continued to train Kung Fu, yet also alongside practice meditation and the teachings of Buddhism. They dedicated themselves to this path in order to develop themselves and thus to better aid others. To further this journey, we will continue not so far from China to Japan, 10th to 16th century, where another legendary class of warriors has originated. Japanese warriors, known as the samurai, were famous not only for demoting their lives to mastering various martial arts, but literally arts as well. Samurai were expected to be cultured and literate and admired the ancient saying Bunbu Ryodo, or the pen and the sword in accord. The samurai were also taught that the path of the warrior was one of honor, emphasizing duty to one's master and loyalty unto death. Their devotion was so highly emphasized that a samurai who has lost his honor or failed his master was meant to commit a suicidal ritual known as seppuku. There are many samurai throughout history which are famous for their skill in battle and strategy, but Miyamoto Musashi stands out as one of the greatest duelists and martial artists. Born in 1584, he was educated by his uncle in Buddhism, basic literary skills, and also the sword. There are many controversial stories about Musashi's oddities, such as that that he have rarely bathed or changed his clothes, as well as having suffered from a somewhat disfiguring skin condition. Yet history agrees about his excellence in the way of the sword. 
Musashi is said to have won his first duel when he was just 13 years old and continued to travel along Japan, engaging in more than 60 duels, always staying undefeated. Yet he did not limit himself to martial arts. Having mastered the sword, he also spent years studying Buddhism and was an accomplished artist, sculptor, and calligrapher. Musashi had little concern for his own personal comfort or even his life and dedicated himself entirely to his development. At the end of his life, he also attempted to transmit his knowledge of self-development and sword by writing a book called the Book of Five Rings. Here he emphasized that samurai should understand not only martial arts but the other professions as well. His teachings said, think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. The bridge from 19th to 20th century brought a few different great martial artists. Jigoro Kano, born 1860, early on became interested in a Japanese martial art known as Jiu-Jitsu. Kano's father was a great believer in the power of education and thus he provided Jigoro with an excellent education. Yet being a slim child, Kano had a strong wish to become stronger. When a family friend told him that Jiu-Jitsu was a good way to develop strength, Kano decided to find a teacher, which was actually not an easy task back at the time. Jiu-Jitsu was becoming strongly unpopular due to the decline of the samurai and the beginning beginning of a new era, yet that did not stop Jigoro's effort. He started going to various body therapists, assuming that they should know the martial arts teachers. Eventually, one of the people indeed directed Jigoro to a jiu-jitsu instructor, which taught him his knowledge. Yet after mastering jiu-jitsu, Kano felt that learning technique was not sufficient. Thus, he started improving the learned techniques, while also adding an emphasis on philosophy and self-development. This mix in turn led to the creation of what is now known as judo. Sensei Kano later stated that, I therefore anticipated that practitioners would develop their bodies in an ideal manner, to be outstanding in matches, and also to improve their wisdom and virtue and make the spirit of judo live in their daily lives. We should be able to move properly in response to our opponents' unexpected attacks and should also not forget to make full use of every opportunity during our practice to improve our wisdom and virtue. These are the ideal principles of my judo. Just a few years after Jigoro Kano, in 1868, Gishin Funakoshi was born in Okinawa, a Japanese island where karate has originated. He was a weak and sickly child, yet nonetheless his parents brought him to karate training, where Funakoshi continued to develop great skills and strength. In 1922, he moved to Japan, where he stayed in a small room of dormitory doing cleaning and gardening during the day and teaching local students karate in the night. Later on, Funakoshi opened his dojo and continued to introduce karate to the Japanese. He's considered the founder of Chotokan Karate perhaps the most widely known style of karate, and is attributed as being the father of modern karate. In addition to being a karate master, he was also an avid poet and philosopher who would reportedly go for long walks in the forest where he would meditate and write poetry. During his life, Funakoshi wrote The 20 Guiding Principles of Karate, where he laid out 20 rules by which students of karate are urged to abide in an effort to become better human beings. One of the principles states, Apply the way of karate to all things. Therein lies the beauty. During the same time, another renowned martial artist lived in Japan. Born 1883, son of a landowner, Mohi Oshiba was a weak, sickly child and bookish in his inclinations. In his early days, he witnessed how his father was beaten by a group of people. This experience led Oshiba to take a promise that he will become strong in order to protect people around him. Oshiba started studying several martial arts during his early life and was well known for his physical strength. In 1950, he met Sokaku Takeda, a master of jiu-jitsu, and was deeply impressed by his skills. Oshiba even built a dojo in his house to invite Takeda as a permanent house guest in order to continue to learn from him. After years of training, he became a master of the art himself. Washiba became so famous for his own martial skills, which led to an advanced practitioners of different martial arts coming to train under him. He was so respected that people referred to him as Osensi, translated as the great teacher. Yet Washiba did not limit himself to martial arts. He also went under a regime of spiritual training, regularly retreating himself to the mountains and performing purification meditation under heavy waterfalls. He was deeply concerned about other people and decided that a new martial art based not only on technical skills but also on self-development is necessary. Thus, he created Aikido. Morihei taught that life is growth. If we stop growing technically and spiritually, we are as good as dead. Another great karate master who was famous for his strength and skill lived in the early 20th century Japan. Masutatsu Ayama, commonly known as Masoyama, was born 1923 in South Korea. He began studying Chinese martial arts at the age of 9 from a Chinese farmer who was working on the farm. Once joy of Ayama's youth and was his first teacher giving young Ayama a seed which he was to plant. When it sprouted, he was to jump over it 100 times a day. As the seed grew and became a plant, Ayama later said that he was able to jump between walls back and forth easily. 
In 1938, Oyama moved to Japan, where in 1946, he started learning Shotokan Karate from the second son of Gishin Funakoshi. Mas later on became so devoted to karate that he retreated to mountains for 14 months, where he spent all his time training in isolation, followed by a second time which lasted 18 more months. Oyama became so strong that he did not only defeat various rivals, but was also able to fight and kill live bulls with his bare hands, sometimes even snapping their horns at the end. In 1957, he created his own karate style known as Kyokushin, which emphasized grueling training and full contact practice fighting. Oyama also emphasized self-development. He was highly influenced by Musashi's The Book of Five Rings and even wrote over 80 books himself. He was passionate about sharing his knowledge and taught that although it is important to study and train for skills and techniques, for the man who wishes to truly accomplish the way of Budo, it is important to make his whole life in training and therefore not aiming for skills and strength alone, but also for spiritual attainment. As we move further, our attention shifts to the West, where some of the greatest martial artists also lived their lives. Born 1914, a Brazilian child named Helio Gracie was frail and sickly. When his brother learned jiu-jitsu and shared it with his family, Helio wasn't allowed to be a part of the training, which involved actual fighting as he was too fragile. Instead, he stood aside and tried to understand the mechanics by watching. Faced with this physical problem, he started developing techniques which were not based much on strength at all, but rather on skill and he became so good at this that when he was 18 he was given his first no holds barred fight against a boxer which lasted less than a minute as Helio choked his opponent out. Helio and his brothers continued to develop his techniques that what led to the creation of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yet this style would have probably not developed if it was not for the passion of Helio to give a chance for the weaker to win against the stronger by creating a martial art not based on strength. He saw this development surpassing martial arts as also a means of self development. As he once said, Jiu Jitsu is like a philosophy. It helped me to learn how to face life. As we move further in time, no list of greatest martial artists of the West could suffice without Bruce Lee. Bruce was born in 1940 at the Chinese hospital in San Francisco's Chinatown. According to the Chinese zodiac, Lee was born in both the hour and the year of the dragon, which according to tradition is a strong and virtuous omen. Indeed, it did seem to be true for his although short, yet highly influential life. After Lee's birth, his family moved back to Hong Kong, where he spent his childhood. In 1957, after losing several fights with rival gang members, Lee began training in Wing Chun Kung Fu under a master named Yip Man. After a year into his Wing Chun training, most of Yip Man's students refused to train with Lee after they learned of his mixed ancestry, as the Chinese were generally against teaching their martial arts techniques to non-Asian. However, Lee shown a keen interest in Wing Chun and continued to train privately with Yip Man himself. Despite his training, Lee often got involved into street fights, which led his father to the decision of sending him back to the United States to pursue a safer and healthier life. In 1959, Li began teaching Chinese martial arts to all people of different race and cultural background. In 61, Bruce started studying drama in university, where he also studied philosophy, psychology, and various other subjects. In 64, after an impressive public demonstration of his martial arts skills, Li was invited for an audition to a television show and was chosen to play the sidekick of a hero in a show called The Green Hornet. This brought him enough attention that some years later, Li started playing main roles and getting more attention to the film industry, eventually becoming a superstar. With a combination of his martial arts skills and charisma, he had a strong influence on both martial arts and the genre of martial arts films. Yet he did not limit himself to physical technique only. Li himself was well read and had an extensive library. He was influenced by the teachings of Taoism, Jiddu Krishnamurti and Buddhism. In 1967, he developed a martial art which he called Jeet Kune Do, governed by a philosophy of self-development. Bruce Lee said himself that too much time is given to the development of skill and too little to the development of the individual for participation. Jeet Kune Do ultimately is not a matter of petty techniques but of highly developed spirituality and physique. Born the same year and also a friend of Bruce Lee, although today Chuck Norris to most is known as a form of humor, he was actually a highly influential and prominent martial artist. As a child, he was non-athletic, shy, and scholastically mediocre. His father went on alcohol drinking binges that lasted for months at a time. Embarrassed by his father's behavior and the family's financial plight, Norris developed a debilitating introversion that lasted for his entire childhood. Yet in 1958, he joined the United States Air Force where he became interested in martial arts which helped him in his development. 
After he discharged from the military in 1962, he continued to train and teach karate while also participating in tournaments. Although he had a varied beginning, experiencing both winning and losing, in 1968 he won the professional middleweight karate champion title, which he held for six consecutive years. In 69, he won karate's triple crown for the most tournament wins of the year and the Fighter of the Year award by Black Belt magazine. Czech has also received a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and made history in 1990 when he was the first Westerner in the documented history of Taekwondo to be given the rank of 8th degree black belt grandmaster. Yet his passion to martial arts was not limited to technique. During his life, Norris created his own style, Chun Kuk Do, translated as the Universal Way, which gave great focus to self development. He was also known as a philanthropist, political activist, and a devoted Christian, and wrote several inspirational books. His determination that led him to learn martial arts was also present in all his life. To quote Chuck, I've always found that anything worth achieving will always have obstacles in the way, and you got to have the drive and determination to overcome those obstacles en route to whatever it is that you want to accomplish. Our last story, although arguably calling a boxer a martial artist, is about a man who brought boxing to the next level. Muhammad Ali, born 1942, showed at an early age that he wasn't afraid of any bout, inside or outside of the ring. At the age of 12, Ali had his bike stolen and told the police officer that he wanted to beat up the thief. The police officer, who was also a boxing coach, suggested that Ali should first learn how to box. Thus, his career began. Ali showed great skills and performance in matches, winning almost all of his fights, including the light heavyweight gold medal in the 1960s. Summer Olympics in Rome and in 63 the heavyweight champion of the world title. Ali was known for his lightning speed and fancy footwork, yet Muhammad has also shown interest in various other subjects. He was concerned about the religious freedom and racial justice which led him to join a controversial movement for the rights of African American people called the Nation of Islam. This led him to resist his draft to serve in the Vietnam War what created various difficulties in his life, yet was an inspiring example for many. In later years, he also became involved in philanthropy, raising various funds for developing countries and on other needs, thus going beyond his fighting skills. When he opened the Muhammad Ali Center, his hometown, he said, I wanted more than a building to house my memorabilia. I wanted a place that would inspire people to be the best that they could be at whatever they choose to do, and to encourage them to be respectful of one another. Most of us are so concerned about becoming good at martial art techniques that as soon as we learn it, we stop because we have no other greater inspiration to go further for. Yet looking at the examples of the greatest martial artists, it becomes clear that the greatness of martial arts skills does not end at the physical development. Each of the great martial artists through all history saw a deeper reason for their training. They had a concern for more than themselves and became devoted to master various abilities and arts to aid others in their development. When they learned their techniques, they did not stop. Their passion for greater goals led them to go further than anyone else. They devoted themselves to becoming the best they can be, thus becoming masters not only in martial arts, but also in life. Which martial artist do you think was the greatest in history? Click on the image or the links below to vote. Also, what do you think makes the greatest martial artists? Join the discussion in the comments. If you like the video, click the subscribe to know when the next video like this one will come out. This is Sensei Rokas, and see you in the virtual mat again soon.